What about what about fruit? Well, again, you know, we don't think that fruit should be a large part of anyone's diet. Uh, I'm sympathetic with the people to, that are in practice. To get them off candy bars and put them on fruit, much better choice. Um, but the fact of the matter is, when we were up in Boston and we had all the professors and researchers helping us, uh, we established that even the healthiest specimens among us really shouldn't, because of this hybridization of sugar, high, high so sweet, should ever eat more than about 15% of our diet by weight as fruit. So look for local fruit, because that is a better chance that it will be ripe, because most fruit is picked unripe. You know, you know if it comes from Mexico or if it comes from Spain or whatever, California, California you know, it was picked unripe. Even here in Florida, the oranges, if you see the big trucks coming, it's all green oranges and green grapefruits. And, you know, they don't ripen off the tree. You become the mother tree, really. All that calcium we were supposed to get from orange and, and uh, grapefruit juice, you actually have to take calcium out to digest it. For so that can for the teeth, it's unbelievable. Yeah, for your teeth, for your bones, that's a disaster. So when I live in Florida, I try to take oranges from the trees, you know, and let them sit there until they're ripe. And that is absolutely the best. I think um, I would agree that fruit, if you look at our food diagram, starchy foods are at the bottom, you know, whole grains and legumes and uh, that sort of thing, and then um, vegetables and then fruit. And so we, we always tell people if you're eating more fruit than vegetables and starchy foods and whole grains, then you're probably overdoing the fruit. And it's easy to do because of the lovely sweet taste, which everybody likes. Um, but fruits are densely nutritious. I agree, the locally grown are the best. They're also the ones that taste best too. If you buy things in season um, and you buy things that are locally grown, they're gonna taste better, they're gonna be fresher. And one uh, thing also is for people who have economic limitations, buying directly from a producer often can make foods cheaper as well. So all for eating fruit, keeping it less than vegetables, less than grains, and uh, local when possible. I would never advise someone not to eat fruit. It's a wonderful, health-promoting, nutritious, natural, wonderful source of fat food, low calorie density. It takes, I mean, literally to get people off of dessert. I work with so many people that come to me with sugar addiction and it is a magic answer is here, try to swap it to fruit. And fruit doesn't taste sweet at first for these people because the threshold of sweet is so high that it, it doesn't even taste sweet. But I've seen this for 20 years, I've been doing this, 24 years I've been, or 22 years, not to date myself, yeah, I'm 73, so this works. <laughs> Um, You've been doing this longer than me. <laughs> and I have seen time and time again, and myself included, that if you get off of those processed sugars and those artificial sugars and you switch it with fruit, all of a sudden, fruit becomes too sweet. I can't eat fruit anymore. It's too sweet for me. And I've seen this with so many people that that natural, your palate completely changes. I think of it like a baby's palate. It's like it's all new and breast milk tastes sweet and everything's sweet. And then we just ruin it. And we just violate our tongues and our taste buds for our whole lives and put all these really processed foods and artificial sweetened, you know, artificial sweeteners are designed to be hundreds or thousands of times sweeter than table sugar. So that just messes everything up. You know, you're having your Diet Coke and then you're, have, you're still craving sugar it perpetuates those sugar cravings. So I think fruit is a win-win-win. You know, it's, it's helped my husband get off of all his sugar, his sugar kick. He had dessert his whole, his whole life. And, um, but fruit is a, is a wonderful answer for a lot of people, and it should not be avoided. Um, allow me to go crazy here about how much I think fruit is probably the most ideal substance for us to eat. That this was one thing I studied immensely because I wanted to study what are we most designed to eat, what are what are we supposed to be eating. Fruit, the antioxidant value of fruit, the fiber content, the effect on the microbiome, the every just everything about fruit. And I've studied. I, can, I, I actually searched the literature to try to find something negative about fruit, to find some study that showed something negative with fruit, and I couldn't find it. I, I think fruit is fantastic. Fruit's been my Boy, fruit, if I had, like, besides my armamentarian of a knife, which I, I, I try not to use if I can, uh, my other big weapon in the barrel is fruit because I could get my patients to eat fruit. And I could get them to eat a lot of fruit. And, I've, and the funny thing is I get a lot of groups of people that come to see me. I get 
vegetarians, I get vegans, I get raw vegans, and the, the healthiest people I ever meet are the fruititarians. And, and I don't believe it. Every time I see them, I'm like, there's something, you, you've got to be missing some. I don't know if you guys know Rawfully Christina. She's got a really big following. And uh, she, she, does, she runs this farm co-op in Houston, and she delivers this, just talk about gorgeous, ripe, beautiful fruit that she delivers. And she eats fruit like crazy. It's, the funny thing, she also eats seasonally. So coming about fall, she starts turning a little orange. Um, <laughs> but but uh, I tested her recently. There's a whole YouTube video about it. That is one healthy girl. And she eats like so much fruit. And the people that follow her eat so much fruit. And anytime I test them, they are some healthy people. Uh, a guy, Mark Michael Arnstein, who's a top athlete, big buckets of fruit, rich roll, tons of fruit. A lot of the, a lot of the healthiest people I know tend to eat the most fruit. Those, in all the different groups, there's the starchitarians and the, you know, we're all, it's crazy how you could take vegans and make us into little cliques. Uh, but, uh, I, but really, the fruititarians are, are really incredible. And I have found myself just experimenting myself. Anytime I increase the fruits, I perform better athletically. And so now I don't do those goo packets and stuff people do on runs I'm fruiting it up uh, dry fruits oranges I mean I eat apples like they're going out of style I think apples might be one and then you can't the, the, the other thing is you don't need to go to Brazil to a treetop to get an acai berry just eat a blueberry now they are yes th we can get into the fact that they are hybridized they're not the blueberries that used to be out there but um but but they're still extremely good for you the ORAC value the antioxidant values through the roof and and so yeah eat your fruit and by the way no one has ever gotten fat off of fruit I, I talked about this before but de novo lipogenesis is in order to take that fruit and process it into fat it is almost impossible you would have to be on an extremely high calorie unbelievably high carbohydrate diet so I actually over I had this one patient who was like well can I eat too many apples I was like okay I dare you to eat too many apples and so she came in one day she's like I ate five apples yesterday and we weighed her and she weighed less and she's like oh no okay you got you win so uh, eat your fruit um, let me just make a couple of comments 35 years ago by chance, we discovered that when dealing with people with cancer, that when they were eating large amounts of fruit, their cancer was growing and metastasizing. And this was a challenge for us, a, a very big challenge for us, because our diet at that point was probably half fruit, giving people. I got a call, finally, after pondering this for several years, uh, from the fellow who was at that point running the Linus Pauling Foundation, uh, one of Pauling's former Phi Beta Kappa students out of Stanford, Dr. Arthur Robinson. And he said, we finally pinned it that the fruit sugar was a pathway in precipitating the metastasy of all forms of cancer. So we, me especially, probably 60% of my diet was fruit at that point. We reluctantly put the brakes on and kept in touch with him and we're pretty much a lone wolf on that and started to look at um, why that was and couldn't find anything in the medical literature. There was nothing. But in the agricultural literature, it was abundantly clear that the hybridization of fruit, and I agree, you can't find anything but hybrid food, and we'd probably die if we didn't do that. But reality was that the average fruit today has 30 times more sugar than the original. Then we'll take into account what Anna Maria uh, stated earlier that no fruit that's commercially sold other than by chance or mistake is ripe when it's picked. The only fruit that inherently ripens after you pick it from the mother plant is a banana. So now we've had a solid 35 years without fruit sugars, and I'll give you some science on this so you can catch up to it. And then 25 years, basically, uh, where we use fruit. And the spectacular changes in disorders are remarkable. And then if you look at my colleague and friend who wrote the most definitive book on cancer, it should be mandated every doctor reads it who deal with cancer. Thomas Seifrey out of Boston College, Cancer is a Metabolic Disease. Uh, we held a medical conference about three years ago, and he was stunned that we didn't eat fruit because everyone in the natural movement says fruit, 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 and the pathways and how it processes through. And he said... Here, I'm going to show you what I've learned over the decades. He said that the only fruit, or the only sugar that acts like fat in the body doesn't create fat. All sugars create fat. So uh, it happens to be fruit sugar. 
So I know this still goes against the literature. <laughs> I actually, no, it doesn't go against the literature. You're actually correct. The, the effect is called the Warburg effect. That's what um, Seifield studies. And what it is is that cancer cells have to have sugar to survive. They only use cellular respiration using sugar. If you have cancer, I would agree with you. We were talking about this before. Um, th there is that effect. My but idea is you don't want to get cancer to begin with, and fruits will, pre fruits don't cause cancer, they will actually help prevent cancer. That's been shown in multiple studies. If you actually have cancer, you kind of want to go into ketosis. You don't want any carbohydrate. That's the only time, you know I'm a carb fanatic. The only time I would retract from my carb fanaticism would be if you actively have cancer, in which case I still want you getting phytonutrients, but you might want to watch out a little bit on, on the sugar side. But saying that sugar causes fat, we've done ward studies on this. Sugar cannot cause fat. It's de novo lipogenesis is almost impossible. Study came out a week ago and discouraged people in British Journal of Medicine on smoothies, showing that it's creating weight. We've seen it with people too. It, you know, it, uh, my, I, I use smoothies all the time. The only problem that you can get into, again, is people are downing. First of all, fruit juice that's a different story, right? You're, you're taking sugar away from the fiber. Well, well, what's the but, difference between fruit juice and the smoothie? Well, the, 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 it's, yeah, it's called, it's fiber. That's the big difference. But what happens is when you're eating pure sugar is you're getting a very quick rise in your sugar level, which causes a quick rise in insulin, which causes a quick drop in your sugar, which leads to you eating more. And that's, so, that's all Dr. Steer work out of Harvard. Yeah, and so debate him. And it's the it's same with Jenkins' work with, with glycemic index, where you're really be creating a higher glycemic index food by doing that. I think the problem with smoothies I get into people, and there, there was a good study that, I uh, can't remember who did it, but, uh, uh, but they were showing that people... Let's, let's ask people in this room, how many of you in this room who ate a lot of fruit and put it in blenders and drank, you know, five bananas or whatever you did in blenders, uh, gained weight on that one? Raise your hand. Okay, nobody in the room. Usually in the room I get, you know, 10 people in a room this size that say that. I know this is one way that we help people reduce weight, is take away condensed large amounts of sugar like that. Now, I use, I use it as a weight loss tool, and I, you know, I treat too. thousands and thousands and thousands of people for weight loss. It's a very successful weight loss tool. But I do agree with the Warburg effect. There's no question once you have a cancer cell, now, my hope is that we prevent the cancer cell from getting there. Well, well, the war, let me explain the, the Warburg, Warburg effect. effect. Back in 1924, Warburg finished a three-year, a four-year study where he showed that all you had to do reduce is one-third of the oxygen in the bloodstream to precipitate cancer growth. He won the Nobel Prize for that years later. That's what Thomas Seifrey uh, did two other studies on and proved his, his work was valid. Well, but if you look at the Warburg effect and you're going to starve out the cancer cell, you're going to have to eliminate carbohydrate. You can't right. just eliminate the fruit. Yeah. And what Seyfried right. is proposing in his book, he's speaking at our conference in a few weeks, we've gotten to know him a little bit. Um, what Seyfried is saying in his book, first of all, is he's proposing ketogenic diets and intermittent fasting and, and uh, even long-term water fasting to a certain extent in order to weaken cancer cells and strengthen human cells so that you could even potentiate small amounts of chemotherapy for some types of cancer. And I think just like uh, when Juliana said, you know, people look at the Mediterranean diet and they say, give me the olive oil, I'll have some red wine, you know, it's, yeah. people try, like to pick and choose. I think the problem is that if you're, if you're trying to address the issue of cancer cells liking sugar and having a preference for sugar and growing themselves, tumors growing themselves this way, Eliminating the fruit and continuing to eat all the rest of it isn't really going to do much good. Um, I would propose that what you really want to do is either put somebody, depending on the type of cancer. I think that's another thing too is that a lot of um, a lot of Safe Rights book is about the types of cancer for which we do not have any solutions at this time, including dietary solutions. And, and so if you can turn it into a chronic condition through intermittent fasting, ketogenic diets, et cetera, so that somebody lives their full lifespan or maybe 20 or 30 years with a brain tumor that would have killed them within six months, you know, it's a, it's a trade-off. So I think it's important. I think if people all read Safe Ride's whole book, they would have a different impression than if they listened to somebody talk about one aspect of it. And, and also keep in mind, the vast majority, everything he's done has been on rats. 
he does have some anecdotal one person this and one person that. Yeah, some of the answer. anecdotals are at Hippocrates Institute. Yeah, and the, and the anecdotal, look, yeah, <laughs> they are. And, and the anecdotal is interesting, but I, I would like to see more. There's, and, and also True North had this a, a, an a anecdotal that was published where they did water fasting on a stage four lymphoma patient and it went away. There's definitely something to that though, but what I really want, it, it's, it feels very Western medicine-y to be looking at how to treat the we have, we have to do that, look at how to treat the disease, but I still want us thinking about how to prevent the disease, and in that regard, fruit is very, very powerful. Let me, let me, because this is an important conversation I think we have, since over half the population will contract cancer. 57% of Americans will contract some form of cancer in their life. So, uh, Cyfrey, who's under political scrutiny constantly and almost lost his tenure, uh, had to water down his book. He told me that privately when I had him at a three-day conference at Hippocrates. So to say that it was only on specific forms of cancer, if you read as clear as I have ten times his book, it says it's every form of cancer, carcinoma, sarcoma, melanoma, etc. Number two, I think it's important that I agree with you that we shouldn't eat cooked carbohydrates that break down to sugar. Number three, in all the years I've done this work, basically what you end up seeing is that when you look at cancer, the best test for most forms of cancer is called a PET scan. A PET scan is actually where you inject sugar into the body. Now, we had a gentleman come to us who happened to be a research physician, and back in those days worked at Stanford, and took a gallon of organic apple juice, distilled out a cup and a half of sugar, and used it at Stanford for the PET scans one day. And it was exactly the same results they had, where the cancer goes to eat the sugar, you see the epicenter of the cancer, and you see the metastasy where it's moving. So that's when I really started to realize that we weren't on the wrong track, when PET scans became prominent about 30 years ago. We did this change 35 years ago. By 25 years ago, this gentleman did that work for us. And so these are serious issues. Now, I agree. Again, let's come back and take a breath. We're all telling you to eat a plant-based diet. We're saying to get you invited into this world, providing you're not sick. Whatever plant-based diet you eat is a hell of a lot better than the diet you're on at this point. We also look at the socioeconomics of fear of this. I can't go in and say everyone eat organic food. Most of us sitting in this room are elitist. Many of you listening around the world probably have money too. But in some of those pockets that I've had the privilege to work in, you don't do that. So just eat plant-based diets. The least expensive diet on the planet Earth is a plant-based diet. No question. The healthiest diet is a plant-based diet. Now, how you do that is variation, but we do know a lot about disease and which ones work best. And by the way, the last thing I want to say is the anaerobic effect. That means that cancer cells do not like oxygen. But guess what? Viruses don't like oxygen, and bacteria do not like oxygen, and mold does not like oxygen, and fungus does not like oxygen. So we eradicated fruit for all those diseases for the last 30 years. Actually, fruit, there's been pretty good studies with fruit and, and, and greens increasing vascularity and thereby bringing oxygen to cells. And there's some bacteria that love anaerobic conditions. Well, you look at things like citrulline that you get off the skin of a watermelon. Throw yeah. the red part away, citrulline, take the citrulline yeah. out of that. That's amazing vascular. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. 